for the day? Yeah. Oh, you know what that means. Thank you for your welcome. You know, every time I get on any stage and I hear the applause, I always remember the story that happened on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago. When our Lord was walking into the city of Jerusalem, and uh, he was, of course, riding on a donkey. And everyone around him was shouting, Hallelujah, glory to the son of David. And the donkey thought I was all for him. <laughs> so I feel like that donkey, you know. I met this morning a couple of kids, and I told them a little story about the mother who was um, very, very angry because her little boy did not behave in school. And, of course, that Sunday did not behave at Mass. And the theme was that, that the priest preached was, we are all the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now you think the little kid, even though he was disturbing everybody and including his mother the most, you think he wasn't listening? Because he came home and mommy started giving it to him. And she was thanking him for it. And he says, Mommy, Mommy, did you hear what Father was preaching? I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you're beating the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and Mama said, Son, I'm not spanking the temple. I'm hitting the sacristy. A guy died and went uh, to uh, heaven. And St. Peter said to him, look, you can't get to uh, heaven without spelling a word. What's the word, Lord? And uh, the Lord said, love. Oh, that's no hard. L-O-V. The Lord said, Peter, let him in. In the meantime, St. Peter's beeper went off and he said, I think one of the saints is calling me. Could you please guard the door? All of a sudden, who appears to the gate of heaven is his wife. Honey, what happened? She said, you won't believe this. We just buried you. We're coming out of the cemetery. This drunk maniac came plowed right into us, and here I am. Oh, you want to go to heaven, I suppose. Yes, honey, I do want to go to heaven. I want to be with you for all eternity. And the husband says, not so fast, not so fast, honey. You got to spell the word. Well, what is the word I have to spell? He goes, Czechoslovakia. Now, husbands and wives, do spell your words before you die, <laughs> just in case. I just remember a story that happened, I guess, uh, happened uh, during the war in Bosnia. As you know, I told you last night that is, there were 1,400 churches and sacred, sacred objects including monasteries and convents that were destroyed. In this particular town, there was a young man who was a soldier who loved the Lord, never wanted to be in the war, but ended up in the war. He came into a town where the church was just completely destroyed. You could smell death all around you. You could smell the horrible uh, smoke that torched the place down. He came to a church. And as he was standing there at the church, the roof has collapsed. The wall was still smoking from the terrible events that just took place. And a beam of the roof fell down 
right on the top of the crucifix, and he wiped about the crucifix's hands, the Lord's hands on the cross. And as he was standing there, as he was wondering what uh, God was saying to him, he heard a voice of the Lord that said, You see, I have no hands. You are my hands. I have no hands. You are my hands. I want to point uh, out to you this afternoon that this is the calling that the Lord has given to all of us. The Lord has created this world. He never asked us. He created us. He never asked us. But there is one thing that is sure. He cannot save this world without you and me. That's why I invite you to be that kind of a donkey that carried Jesus to Jerusalem, that carried Jesus down to Egypt to save his life. God has no hands, but we are his hands. I call upon each and every one of you, young and old and in between, priests and sisters, and all of you good people to become evangelizers in the world today. The Holy Father has called us on numerous occasions, and he said even to the youth recently, if you have experienced Christ, if you have encountered Christ, spread him. You know what's important? It's not what we have heard here this weekend, and we heard enough. We heard so many beautiful things. What happens is, and what counts is, once we leave here, will we be that hand that Jesus expects us to be? Will we go out into the highways and bowings of this dark world and bring Jesus? Because do not underestimate what's happening out there. The world is waiting for Jesus. He, the world is waiting for evangelizers. The world is waiting for courageous men and women who will not be afraid to say that Jesus is Lord and that he's calling us to go into the whole world and to evangelize, to bring the good news to the whole world. A few years ago, I was at the charismatic conference with my aunt and my mother in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And we were walking on the boardwalk during the lunch hour. And there were a bunch of teenagers that approached me and said, hello, father. Do you have a little time? Can we talk to you? I said, sure. And they said to me, just point blank, the question we want to ask you is this, do you know Jesus Christ? And I just pointed to my collar, and I said, I beg your pardon? I'm a priest. I better know him. But they said, oh, we're not blind, Father. We know you're a priest. But the question is, do you know Jesus Christ? And I said to them, are you willing to tell me about him? They said, yes. And so they sat down in this circle. They crossed their legs so quickly. I had a hard time to do that. <laughs> and I bent down with them, and for the next two hours, they told me what Jesus means to them. And if there is any young teenagers here today, may I speak to you for one second. If you're young and you think you, don't, you can't do it, the Lord is calling you to bring him to your schools, to your place where you play, places where you hang out. The Lord doesn't have anybody else but you. You are my hand, he said. Now, you don't have to be uh, uh, of certain age. You don't have to go to the seminary to know theology. You know, I do have a few degrees in theology. I have more degrees maybe than any thermometer. <laughs> but that's not going to get me to heaven. It's what's in here. It's how I respond to the Lord. Knowledge can be dangerous at times, and we have seeing that in the church today. Not all theologians are godly people. And I dare say this, that they may know 
everything about Jesus and that is different. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they know him. Because to know him is what our vocation is all about. You know, as a priest, one day I decided to be good. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I, I goofed in many occasions, in many areas of my life. I'm going to be good from now on. <clears throat> I bet you God laughed when I said that. Because comes Monday night, I did the, my examination of conscience, and I wasn't that hot, I tell you. I failed in many areas. <clears throat> then the next day, I said, Lord, I'm sorry, I'll do better tomorrow. <clears throat> then comes Tuesday, I examined my conscience, I wasn't doing that hot. In fact, worse than Monday. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Quickly, I didn't want to look over my sins and failures. So I said, Wednesday's the day, Lord. You know, we're going to do better, right? Wednesday well, was worse than Tuesday and Monday. And so, the same way on Thursday. Comes Friday, I cried to him and I said, Lord, I decided to be good. Why isn't it working? And he gave me a quick answer. He spoke to my heart and he says, because you want to do be holy, you want to be God on your own, but you can't. Lord, what do I have to do, I cried. He says, let me do it. That's what God is saying to all of us. Let me do it. You don't have to do a thing. He wants to sanctify you. He wants to touch you. To be an evangelist doesn't mean that you are some kind of the Protestant preacher. To be evangelist simply means to go out into the highways and byways, into the ordinary life, and bring Jesus to somebody else. That's what Mother Teresa preached all the time. Do you know Jesus? You know where he dwells. Go to him, touch him. <coughs> he is and must become priority and Lord in your life. He is the Lord of everything you do. He is the Lord of all your attempts. He is the Lord of all your decisions. You have to say, first of all, I decide to follow you. You know, there is no decision. There is nothing. If you don't decide to do something, then you, have, you will never reach your goal. In fact, I think sometimes not to decide is also to decide. You must decide. And say, from this day on, I give you everything that I am. Lord, take over. Begin to work in me. And he will. Then you begin to build with him. Going to the unknown. We always pray every day, thy will be done. You know, the other way is better. My will be done. But it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Thy will be done. And as you do that, be positive thinker. God never works in the negative. He always is in the positive. Just think the Lord can take care. You know, when I get a little down or depressed or whatever, I have to remind myself daily of certain things. God can do it. I cannot. God can. With things, all things are possible with God. God can do it. <clears throat> And then when you call upon the Lord, when you begin to pray and converse with him to sanctify you, get ready for whatever the Lord calls you to do. You cannot be good on your own. But when God makes you good because you are good, you are not created for damnation. He not only created you, but he sanctified you. That means he made you holy. holy. He called you into his marvelous light to be a sharer of his life. <clears throat> to know God and to know about God are two different things. To be religious and to be spiritual are two different things. We have full churches of religious people. They talk a lot to God. In fact, I heard of the lady who was telling us how she says her rosary very fast. She said, one our Father, one Hail Mary, and then I go, as before, as before, as before, as before, as before, <laughs> as before. And she said, in three minutes, I'm finished. I say, 20 rosaries a day, as before. 
Do you know what our prayer life has become? Our prayer life has become nothing else but a machine. Years ago, when I entered religious life, my uh, director called me in and said, Gio, do you pray? Ay, 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 what a question. Because I was thinking that prayer is nothing else but, you know, reading the book. So I said, we were living by the water. I said to him, Father, no, I don't pray as much as I used to because I was count talking and uh, thinking about the book and prayer book that I used to use. He says, but you know what? I thought I was changing the conversation. I said, you know what, Father? <clears throat> the other morning I went by the sea. It was 5.30 in the morning. The sun was coming out. The sea was so calm. It was so beautiful. I could, for the first time, hear seagulls calling one another in their own morning song. And I felt so good there. And I said, Lord, how good it is to be here this morning. And he jumped up and he says, and you say that you don't pray. That's the best prayer that you have ever prayed. I said, thank you, Lord. <coughs> <coughs> Let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. He, does, he asked us not to say too many words. When two people are in love, do they say, oh, honey, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you? They just look at each other. There was a man that used to go to church and sit there all day long. A pastor came there and said, what are you doing here all day long? He said, nothing. You mean nothing? You don't pray the rosary? You must be boring. He says, no, I'm not. He said, well, what are you doing here? He says, he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. <laughs> he was praying. He was praying. That's the first thing you and I have to learn is to say, okay, Lord, what's up? You know, I was in trouble once. I wanted to buy a truck to help the poor. It didn't work. I went to see. They asked $10,000 for exactly the truck I wanted. So I said, Johnny taught me how to pray. Be to the point. Be quick. Tell him what you want. Be specific. And talk to him as you would to your uh, best friend. So I went into my chapel that night. I says, Lord, forgive me, I don't know how to pray, but Johnny told me to be to the point, and I am to the point, I need that truck. <laughs> Number two, I am not going to take no for an answer. <laughs> Number three, I need more than a truck, I need a miracle, because that thing costs $10,000, which I don't have. So I, I, I said, look, you know, I'm tired, I've been walking, working all day, and uh, <clears throat> I, I'm leaving. I got to go to bed, you don't go to bed. You're in glory. You think it's easy to be human? <clears throat> I was giving God instructions, you know. So there was a statue of the Blessed Mother that years ago I brought from, from uh, Fatima. And I looked at the statue and said, Mama, you got the whole night. Talk to a you boy. <laughs> Tell him I need the truck. It's not for me, it's for the poor. Pastors told me that I can pick all the clothes I want, but it's not going to touch their property. So I said, look, I, uh, would you give it to me? Would you allow it if I bring the truck so people can put it right inside? And I'll get all the dust and all the bugs and everything that you're worried about? He said, yeah, but I don't have a truck now. I got to talk to the Lord. So I said, forget it. Next morning I got up and I said, uh-oh, I'm not going to that chapel because maybe God said no. But I went downstairs, and at 10.30, the mailman came, and the secretary came to me. says, did you say you, you, you were going to buy a truck? I said, yeah, I was going to. I found exactly the truck that I need. But you know what? It's $10,000, and I don't have it. She said, the truck is paid for. Look at this. Dear Father, use it as you need. A $10,000 check. I guess the blessed mother was talking to her boy all night. You see, you do it on faith. You don't know where they're going to come out. You don't know how. You just say, trust. Hey, you know, it's not my work, Lord. You sent me, but you better provide. So one day I went on faith. I sent about 10 containers to Bosnia. Not a penny left. And I know the ship uh, uh, person that is shipping them is going to come. And I was in debt $30,000. I said, where is Johnny? How does that go? Be to the point. Just say what you have to say. Go and be quick, be specific, and then expect a miracle. So I went and I said, Mommy, you talk to the boy again. You have to. 
I'm in trouble. I'm in this business of serving the poor. It is his poor, not mine. And you know what? The next day came a check from Anchorage, Alaska. You know what? The check was from a gravel company. Never heard of them. Never heard of them. Never knew who they were. And they sent me $30,000. And do you know what's so funny about that? When I am in trouble and I ask God to help me, <clears throat> he never give me one penny extra more than I ask. <coughs> God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? <clears throat> you know, when you want to serve the Lord, we, and there is problems, there is wars, there is all kinds of things, you go before him and you say, Lord, what, what can I do? You know, there's two questions like that, except they sound differently. One is, what can I do? And the second one is, what can I do? <laughs> you know, the second one is better than the first one, because the first one helps you to wash your hands and do nothing. The second one is better because it, it, uh, it is directing you to trust on the Lord and allow God to do something. That's all you have to say to God is yes, and then you'll get in trouble. <laughs> My dear friends, in order to be holy, what must we do? We must talk to him, we must trust him, and then we must love one another and be in the company of the people that have the same aspiration, the same love, the same desire to serve the Lord as you. And you know, when you serve the Lord, you're not serving him just for yourself so you can get to heaven. My mom was the best evangelist when, she was, uh, when I was a young boy. She said to me, you know, if you help one soul to get to heaven, you, make sure, you will be sure that your soul will get there. So I said, Mama, I want more than one there, just in case. Good boy, she said. <laughs> you have to associate with people who have the same interests. Who, have, who are doing the same, the same thing. In Italian, they say, dimmi con chi vai e ti dirò chi tu sei, which means, tell me with whom you're going, and I'll tell you who you are. Whom are you associating with? What are your priorities? That's what we ought to ask ourselves. You know, I associate with so many people who have inspired me. I am not because, uh, what I am because I just popped up on the scene and became funny. No, I have been touched by so many people who love Jesus. Recently, I met the Croatian priest, Father Sudas. He re received the stigmatas on his hand and his side. And I just wonder, Lord, why don't you want to drill people's arms and hands? I said, God, why nobody said, so that people may know I'm still around. That's why I allowed these things to take place. So I associate with him, I, as, I, I associate with people never knowing what will happen, but be open because God works through people. Look, if he can use the donkey, he can use you. <laughs> <clears throat> and when you do, be ready to experience great things because great things do happen when God mixes with men. You know, one day I just took it, uh, I said a prayer in the morning. I'm praying that this machine doesn't start flashing soon because I have lots to tell you. I, I was praying, and then you know what happened? I said, Lord, I'm going fishing today. I want to catch a fish. Give me a big one today. I love fishing, but I was praying because in my community, everything was going down the hill. I used to preach, everybody went to sleep. I used to yell, fire, fire. They woke up and say, I'll say in hell if you don't wake up, but it didn't faze them at all. So I went on the pulpit and I preached and I thought I gave the most dull sermon I ever gave to anybody. And I said, forgive me, Lord, for I don't know how to speak. The next Sunday, a guy approached me as I was going to the church to say mass. And he said, Father Gio, can I speak to you for just one minute? And I said, I'm in a hurry. Well, what is it? Can you see me after mass? He said, no, I'm in a hurry. I have to tell you. He says, I have not been in church for 20 years. And then I was coming down Anderson Avenue the other day, and I, it was Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, and I heard this guy shouting and screaming, 
And I said, let me see what that nut is talking about. <laughs> and he said, that was the morning I said prayer for, for, to catch a big fish. And do you know what? He said, I walked in, and when I walked in, all the people disappeared. I didn't see anybody. I didn't see you either. I didn't hear you either. I saw Jesus there telling me, welcome. Welcome home. Thank you, you came here. He says, Father, I went to confession. I have renewed my heart. I cried for my sins, and I'm going to Mass every day. God is full of surprises, isn't he? So the next uh, uh, week or so, I didn't know where he went. Uh, I, I was uh, driving in a turnpike with the Archbishop from Zagreb, and we were going to go and see our local Archbishop. And then we come, and the Archbishop and I are talking, and all of a sudden, what I experience is uh, I'm giving my hand out to pay the ticket, the turnpike, and this voice comes from this booth say, Father Gio, is that you? I looked, and there is this guy. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. No, Father, you don't have to pay. Just go, just go, just go. <laughs> I said, God, you're full of surprises, aren't you? You see, what I'm trying to say is do not be afraid to evangelize. Do not be afraid to say, you teenagers, you know, you're going to feel shy. Don't be ashamed of Jesus because Jesus will be ashamed of you on the day of judgment. You know, just go to your friends and say, you know, I've been to church yesterday. This was the, uh, you know, bald-headed priest. He was funny and he was preaching and he was talking. What was he talking about? Jesus, can I tell you what he said? Buy a tape if you forgot. Tell them about Jesus in your own way. They won't listen to me because they'll see a color and get scared. But they'll listen to you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do something beautiful for God today. You know, when I, <clears throat> when, uh, when I see that so many young people are leaving the church, you know, I'm a, a, I don't like it, and you don't either. But you know what? We scare them. We scare them away. We tell them what to do in the church. Pray, be this, be that. You know what we should start telling them? Just fall in love with Jesus. And they will begin to pray. They will begin to love. You know, it's a shame. I go sometimes to a non-denominational church for prayer meetings. In New York City, there is a Times Square church that houses about 10,000 young people. I'm the oldest one when I go there. I took my Archbishop of Zadar, Croatia, there, and he thought it was phenomenal. 10,000 people worshiping Jesus. And you know what's very hurting? Afterwards, they're not in a hurry to leave like we are at our churches. Oh, I hope you, I go to the, to the mass, that, uh, to the priest that's not going to preach too much. So, you know, we go out and we did our obligation. You know what I've discovered? I discovered this. That 87% of people I spoke to in these non-denominational churches are ex-Catholics. And I asked them, before you came here, where were you? I was Catholic. Why did you leave? Because here I met Jesus. Something for us to think about. You see, they may not experience what we older people experience, but they're honest. They're honest and they'll tell us that. Parents, give Jesus to your children. You know, isn't it said that they receive confirmation and in many cases, at least where I come from, confirmation is religious graduation, graduation from religion. The other day a guy shouted, Father Gio, do you know me? I didn't know him from a hole in a wall. He says, you used to teach me I was your altar boy. When he told me who he was, I recognized him. Where you been all these years? Well, you know how it is, Father. I'm busy. Yeah, but you're getting older too. And you know what? Soon you will have to face God. And you know when you want to serve the Lord, you just ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he'll give you a job. I wanted to serve the youth in the parish, and it didn't work. Everything I tried, it didn't work. So you know what I did? One day I started praying, Lord, bring me youth. The next day the phone rang and said, wait a minute, Father, the Archbishop is on the phone. He wants to talk to you. Oh, what did I do now? 
the Archbishop doesn't go. He says, Gio, you know, there's a youth jail down uh, in, in the next city. He says, there's no priest there. Would you mind taking that job? I says, yeah, that's an answer to my prayer, Bishop. And I've been working there, and they're tough guys, you know. The youngest one is 11. The oldest one is 18. One day I was looking at uh, the 18 years of age, and uh, he looked at me and says, I don't want to see you today. And the other one shouted, but I do. And I says, look, son, I'm not here for you. The Lord sent me here for him. So I just looked at him and looked at him and looked at him. And he said, well, you're looking at me. I says, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking through you. <laughs> and he says, what do you see? I see a hurting young man. You want to sit down and talk about it? Sure, Rob. I didn't let him go until he cried on my shoulder. Because I found a very strong black athlete football player, but very little boy inside that needed healing and understanding and love. And at the end of my session with him, he says, gave me a hug and says, and you know, all over the world says, don't touch, don't hug. I said, the heck with those signs. When the Lord tells me to hug, I'll hug. And he said to me, he says, I wish you were my father. You know what? There's a hurting world out there. And it is Jesus who counts on us to bring the healing love to him. How do you do it? <clears throat> is Jesus boring? No. Maybe we are boring sometimes how we approach or tell our youth to approach him. We give them religion, but do we give them the living Christ? We have religious people all over. Just go to church on Palm Sunday. Back home, we call them AMP Catholic. Our supermarket is AMP, Atlantic and Pacific. We call them AMP, Ash Wednesday and Palm Sunday. <laughs> <coughs> religious people are all over. You know, you can recognize them, especially, I don't put down Italians, but they go like this and like this and like this and like this and then... Mm -hmm. You know they haven't been, and I looked at one, I says, boy, you have delicious fingers, don't you? You're licking them. <laughs> they may know religion, but do they know the living Jesus? We don't need religious people. We need godly people, God-centered people, who will go out into the highways and byways and risk everything for our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you get to Jesus? You have to desire it. You have to decide it. There was a saintly fellow who once, one day said to a saint, how do I become holy? How do I get to God? He says, come by the river tomorrow. So he came by the river and he says, walk with me into the river. When he, they were up to their waist, he pushed them under the water and kept them there until bubbles started coming out. Then he came out. The next day he says, come back, I'll tell you tomorrow. So for the next three days he was doing the same. And he's, the fourth day, he says, I'm not coming there because you're going to put me down and choke me. He says, no, I'm not. The fourth day, I'll tell you what it's all about. So he came by the river and he says, you know what? I want you to tell me, once I held you down three times, what was the thing that was coming to your mind? And he said, air, air, air. <laughs> so you had a desire for air, haven't you? He said, yes. I'll tell you something, he says. When you have the same type of desire for God as you have for the air when you were under the water and the bubbles were coming up, then you will find him. Just don't underestimate God. God can change you. God can use you. But it does begin with a decision. You must decide. Then it continues with prayer, and prayer is conversation. Sometimes standing before him and saying nothing. But let him speak. Mother Teresa gave us an example. She said, I used to go before the Lord and I say nothing. I just waited until he began to talk. What a marvelous woman. She taught this generation how to pray. The results are that God will respond. He will hear an honest heart prayer. He will sanctify you. He will send you. 
But you never go out to seek God for yourself. You have to be, get rid of your selfishness. I tell you quickly, my own sister had a husband who was an atheist. And I think we all have a lot of atheists in our families here and there. One day she said, I'm going to marry this guy. And I was going to the seminary. Now, is she going to marry him for what? She says, whom you want me to marry? I said, some nice Italian Catholic. Maybe Irish, as long as he goes to church. She looked at me and said, oh, you want a clean fish, right? He said, I am marrying him because he doesn't know God. Wow, I had to keep quiet then. And you know, for 20 years, he hasn't said a word. He just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. She never complained. She said, honey, you don't have to go to church. I'm going to pray for you. He didn't. Four children came. They all went to church, were baptized, were great children. But one day, God wanted to do something for him. You know what he did? He gave my sister cancer. Serious cancer. She was operated. They couldn't take everything out. And then there was plenty left to reproduce. One day he came to the hospital and said, started crying, honey, I'm going to lose you. And he, she says, you don't have to. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm not going to die. No? He says, no. But I could. It's all up to you. If you accept Jesus as your Lord, and if you begin to pray, and you turn to your life to him because we're not here forever, I will get healed. What a faith. He said, what do I have to do? She says, you don't have to do nothing. Just come over here, I'll hold your hand, kneel down, and say, repeat after me, but don't repeat it unless you mean it. So you know, like a good Catholic, she led him in with a Protestant prayer. <laughs> and she said, Lord Jesus, I have been away from you all my life. I don't know who you are, but he, he wasn't a far away because he had a contemplative nun that was praying for him alongside with my sister in a convent in Croatia. She said, I don't know you, Lord. And there he is, I don't know you, Lord. Lord, have mercy, forgive me all my sins. And then after he said a prayer, he got up. She said, not so fast. Kneel down, we're going to say the rosary now. <laughs> What's rosary? I don't know this. You don't have to know it. I'll do it and you're just, you're going to say 50 times the same thing. But don't say even once unless you mean it. Okay. So he did a prayer. Then he says, you know, you can go home and take children to, to church tomorrow. And you know what? He did. He did. Monday morning, the Jewish uh, surgeon that operated on her came and said, let's see how cancer has progressed. He put it into a CAT scan. After he put it in, he called a technician and says, this machine doesn't work, it's broken. So he comes up and he says, it worked about an hour ago. And he looked at it and says, this thing is working. Why do you say it's not working? Because this girl is full of cancer and the cancer doesn't show up on the, uh, on the CAT scan. Well, I'm here, put her in. They put it in, they take it out, blank. The Jewish doctors looked at her and says, Lady, you have yourself a miracle. You have no cancer. It's all gone. And she's smiling. She says, Of course it's all gone. God allowed it for a time, for a reason and a season. My husband accepted Jesus as Lord of his life. And you know what? Last August, I married this oldest son. It's come by the sacristy, and my sister says, you know, I don't wear any mascara or any of that stuff, so I can cry. He says, I'm not crying for my son. She says, but if my husband comes for communion, don't refuse it. He went to confession yesterday, and today is his first holy communion. God is full of surprises. If you trust him, he would respond. Don't ever question why and how. Just do it and say, here I am, Lord. Sometimes he's going to give you difficulties that you will not understand. He will put you in situations that you will not understand. But the point is, bring him to the whole world. Use him with your own, <clears throat> with your own little imagination, with your own little gift. Every one of us, we were told this weekend, is a gifted person. I told you last night. 
Mother Teresa used to say, what I can do, you cannot. Not all of you can preach up here. No, no, I cannot be what you are. I cannot, I don't go places where you go. You don't go places where I go. But wherever you are, bloom where you are planted and do something beautiful for Jesus today. I pray you would. And may Jesus give you his peace. Bring him to the whole world because he is Lord now and forever. God bless you.